Chapter 9, which, among other things, may serve as a comment on that saying of Iskini's that drunkenness shows the mind of a man as a mirror reflects his person. The reader may perhaps wonder at hearing nothing of Mr. Jones in the last chapter. In fact, his behavior was so different from that of the persons there mentioned that we chose not to confound his name with theirs. When the good man had ended his speech, Jones was the last who deserted the room. Thence he retired to his own apartment to give vent to his concern. But the restlessness of his mind would not suffer him to remain long there. He slipped softly, therefore, to Allworthy's chamber door, where he listened a considerable time without hearing any kind of motion within, unless a violent snoring, which at last his fears misrepresented as groans. This so alarmed him that he could not forbear entering the room, where he found the good man in the bed in a sweet, composed sleep, and his nurse snoring in the above-mentioned hearty manner at the bed's feet. He immediately took the only method of silencing this thorough bass, whose music he feared might disturb Mr. Allworthy, and then, sitting down by the nurse, he remained motionless till Bliffil and the doctor came in together and waked the sick man in order that the doctor might feel his pulse and that the other might communicate to him that piece of news which, had Jones been apprised of it, would have had great difficulty of finding its way to Mr. Allworthy's ear at such a season. When he first heard Bliffle tell his uncle this story, Jones could hardly contain the wrath which kindled in him at the other's indiscretion, especially as the doctor shook his head and declared his unwillingness to have the matter mentioned to his patient. But as his passion did not so far deprive him of all use of his understanding as to hide from him the consequences which any violent expression towards Bliffle might have on the sick, this apprehension stilled his rage at the present, and he grew afterwards so satisfied with finding that this news had in fact produced no mischief that he suffered his anger to die in his own bosom without ever mentioning it to Bliffle. The physician dined that day at Mr. Allworthy's, and having after dinner visited his patient, he returned to the company, and told them that he had now the satisfaction to say with assurance that his patient was out of all danger, that he had brought his fever to a perfect intermission, and doubted not by throwing in the bark to prevent its return. This account so pleased Jones, and threw him into such immoderate excess of rapture that he might be truly said to be drunk with joy, an intoxication which greatly forwards the effects of wine, and as he was very free too with the bottle on this occasion, for he drank many bumpers to the doctor's health as well as to other toasts, he became very soon literally drunk. Jones had naturally violent animal spirits. These being set on float and augmented by the spirit of wine produced most extravagant effects. He kissed the doctor and embraced him with the most passionate endearments, swearing that next to Mr. Allworthy himself he loved him of all men living. Doctor, added he, you deserve a statue you to be erected to you at the public expense for having preserved a man who is not only the darling of all good men who know him but a blessing to society the glory of his country and an honor to human nature damn me if i don't love him better than my own soul more shame for you cries thwackham though i think you have reason to love him for he hath provided very well for you and perhaps it might have been better for some folks that he had not lived to see just reason of revoking his gift jones now looking on thwackham with inconceivable disdain answered and doth thy mean soul imagine that any such considerations could weigh with me no, let the earth open and swallow her own dirt. If I had millions of acres, I would say it, rather than swallow up my dear glorious friend. Quis desiderio sit pudor aut modus tam chari capitis? What modesty or pleasure can set bounds to our desire of so dear a friend? The word desiderium here cannot be easily translated. It includes our desire of enjoying our friend again, and the grief which attends that desire. 